So right here I have a copy of a magazine for which Cristoforo Barbato wrote a report in the year 1996. The magazine was the Italian magazine Notiziario UFO, which does not exist anymore. And this report was about the Star Wars, the NASA Star Wars. And uh, the article was was written with the collaboration of other guys, Adriano Forgione, Alberto Mancinelli, Umberto Tredico. It was about, I'm sure you remember, the footage taken by a space shuttle discovery, in which you see something that appears an attempt to destroy a UFO out the atmosphere with the maybe brilliant peebles. Yes, this it, is the STS yes. footage. Yes, 1991. Here we have another report made by Cristoforo Barbato in 1997. It is an interview by phone with Robert Odin, the retired ah, wonderful. American soldier okay. of the US Army. Yes. And then I have here the copy of the magazine where was published my interview to Cristoforo Barbato, which came out in uh, April 2006 on this magazine, UFO Notiziario, which is even now the main ufological magazine. To show you yes. a, a frame of okay. the introduction to the Jesuit footage because there is there are some markings there is a, a classification here on the top you have three letters S V S which is a mystery still now even now Barbato doesn't want to talk about this and then under there is there are the first letters of the main space program which is uh, of, of of course, it's not a, an official position by the Vatican. But anyway, according to the Jesuit, the first letters K, E, are the letters which indicate Kerygma, the, the most important space program by the Vatican. And then you have S, I, which are the first letter of the name of the space probe, uh, which was launched uh, in the first years in the, of the 90s and uh, its name is Siloe, right. the space prop that uh, would have done the Jesuit footage. Uh, by the way, this is important. Jesuit footage is the expression that I have done to the controversial footage. And then you have in Roman letters the year in which the data were sent to a radio telescope in Alaska. Right, and the, the, this telescope in Alaska this is, is another, another piece of information. Okay, because and it's, it's owned by the Jesuit? Uh, held by Jesuits, which belong to the SIV, Servizio Informazione del Vaticano. Of course, we are talking about classified information according to the Jesuit. And officially, we have the Vatican Advanced Technology Telescope in Arizona, which uh, is in charge uh, to help the Jesuits to have, uh, you know, uh, nice uh, scientific researches about the, the deep space, the universe. And then this is another picture, which was not uh, in the public domain, gave from the Jesuit to Barbato. And, uh, of the aurora? Yes. Yes. According to the Jesuit, it was taken f from, uh, by a space shuttle crew in 1992, if I, no, in 2002, if I remember. And this is uh, an evidence 
that uh, the Jesuit gave to Barbato. This is another evidence, not in public domain, until uh, this magazine published in 2006. You have this one, Hubble Space Telescope, you know, it's a sort of, uh, uh, how do you call it? the small uh, decoration you put on the dress. Uh, in English, I don't remember. Yeah, yeah. A decal? Yeah, it's called a decal. Yeah, my, for decal the dress. Insignia. You know. A little insignia. Yeah, yeah. to put uh, on mm -hmm. your suit. Yes. And then you have this one, Keyhole 12, Super Spy in Space. Look at the two, <laughs> the two, emble the two writings that you have here. NASA, yeah, NASA and CIA. And Central Intelligence Agency. Yes. Mm -hmm. This was not in the public domain until Barbato came out with this material. And also, these two gentlemen here, of course, this everybody knows him, should know him, is President Dwight Eisenhower. This gentleman here is uh, James Francis McIntyre, the former uh, Bishop of Los Angeles, and uh, the Jesuit confirmed to Barbato that this gentleman was present at Muro Airfield in February 1954 because Dwight Eisenhower wanted to have a spiritual support to take an important decision for the mankind because there were already rumors about this presumed meeting occurred in February 1954 between a, a delegation from Earth and a presumed alien delegation from outside our world. And the Jesuit, and this is very important, for the first time we have we had a deep thought from the Vatican who confirmed yes this meeting happened. Yes, James Francis McIntyre participated. And moreover, the Jesuit told Barbato that later on a few days later, James Francis McIntyre broke the rules because, of course, the American administration, I'm talking about the leaders who were participate, participants of that meeting, uh, said to the bishop, yes, you were present because of Dwight Eisenhower's desire. You are not allowed to talk about this, even to the Pope. But McIntyre took another decision and a few days later took a flight and went to Rome and told everything to the Pope, who was, of course, shocked. And according to the Jesuit, this was the first reason for uh, the creation of this presumed secret service, the Servizio Informazioni del Vaticano, SIV. But according to the historical essay found out by Barbato, Ratlines, this secret agency was already uh, in charge before, during the Second World War. So somebody could think, okay, this Jesu Jesuit is not a reliable person. On the other hand, maybe the Jesuit was convinced to say the truth. Who knows? The important thing is that the same expression, Servizio Informazione del Vaticano, was used by the Jesuit and is present in a book, historical book, written by a former attorney, John Loftus and a journalist, Mark Aron. You are saying the Jesuit had a different impression of when this organization and why the organization was formed. Is that correct? In other words, you're saying that according to the story... There is a contradiction. The, but even Barbato pointed out this. Can you explain of that? Course. What is the contradiction think about, exactly? Think about uh, the genesis of Central Intelligence Agency. Right. Central Intelligence Agency, if I'm correct, was born in 1947. But before, there was another secret service. It, had, it had another name, 
That's or right. the office, office of strategic service. Mm -hmm. So what did he change? The name, the structure, the hierarchy, maybe, but Barbato pointed out on one of his articles, happened the same. The Secret Service in the Vatican was born for other reasons, and then this outstanding event occurred in February 1940, 1954 excuse me, in California, and this changed a lot the reasons to keep, to carry on such a structure. Okay, now we have another problem. Other beings from other regions of the universe are here on the Earth. This is a threat, for, of course, not only to humanity, but first of all, to the, to the faith of the Christians, of the Catholics, even to the existence of the Vatican. You have to consider this problem. And one of the reasons uh, was... Uh, Keep a secret service to avoid to you know to maintain the yeah. secrecy. No, to to have the opportunity to know what other secret services abroad could learn about these creatures. This is what uh, I understood. This is what Barbato told me, and this is what is public. The okay. Pope was very worried, and at the same time, this is another important point, other creatures from other regions in the universe, according to the Jesuit, began to have contact with the Vatican, with the SIV, Servizio Informazione del Vaticano, and even a couple of meetings took place in the Vatican Gardens, among other creatures. Okay, but and when was this? Maybe in the 50s. Was we it after about the, the meeting 50. with Eisenhower? And after. after. At the same time, you have at least two races. According to the reports, you have at least two races. One of them is the race who, took, uh, who had the contacts at Murok Airfield, which became later Edwards Air Force Base. And then at the same time, or oh, just a few months later, you have another race, human looking, you cannot distinguish them from us, and uh, they had contacts with the American administration. I'm talking about uh, uh, the people who had the need to know. At the same time, they had contacts with the Vatican. And uh, those creatures said, you have to be very careful with the other creatures. This is very important because usually when somebody talks about the presumed meeting which occurred on Feb in February 1954, they think that those creatures were just human looking like us. Yes, maybe they were humanoid, but they were different. There, there is at least one other race, human looking, much more than them. And uh, they, were, they were very worried about the secret agreement signed among the Eisenhower administration by secrecy and those races. And did the Jesuits say all of that to Abato, or is this your own summary of the situation? This is what uh, the Jesuit told Barbato, and Barbato told in the interview, and even in other... Uh, first of all, in the press release that Barbato made public in year 2005, at the same time when there was the first meeting in which he showed the Jesuit footage to the public, Jesuit footage who was never given to anybody. From okay, the... was Barbato... How did the how did the Vatican react when Barbato came forward with his story? No reaction. None. No reaction. Has Barbato been threatened? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, no. Okay. I don't know anything about what happened to him. According to me, there was no threat okay, from but, but Vatican to him. Surely you are a journalist. You must have asked him if he was threatened. You yourself have had threatening never... phone calls, have you not? 
I had some problems with my internet connection, for example, many informatic intrusions. I had many informatic attacks and uh, also in the last month even a small disinformation campaign began against me, against my reputation. And I have to tell you that these people are playing with the fire. Because maybe somebody <laughs> thinks that I am stupid. Oh, well, maybe I'm not a famous journalist, but I'm not stupid. <laughs> so, I even this small disinformation campaign against me, against my reputation, is a... Uh, a little piece of a big puzzle which indicates to me that maybe I touch very sensitive points. Let me tell you something about the alien threat. For example, I have a lot of respect for what Dr. Stephen Greer did and is doing. I mean, it is an outstanding job like yours. I'm very surprised because there are still people, you know, that uh, in spite of every difficulties are, you know, they are keeping their efforts, they don't give up. But Dr. Stephen Greer, which uh, did a, a great job, particularly in May 2001, when he was uh, the chairman of the press conference at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., and there were more than 20 witnesses involved in the past on extraterrestrial affairs and UFOs. Even today, Stephen Greer says he's convinced because of his information that there is no, there is no alien threat. Okay, let me tell you something about this. Here we have, behind me, we have some frames of a gentleman who is now dead. He died in 1996, January 1996. I'm talking about Phil Schneider, Philip Schneider. Uh, this guy was an insider. His wife, uh, the former wife, Cynthia Dreyer, still, she, he is still now trying to open a case about the death of her former husband because of the mysterious circumstances in which he died and Schneider for many years for for a couple of years gave many lectures and said yes there are extraterrestrial races which are benevolent at least two of them and uh, but I'm, I'm sorry but there are other guys in the universe which are not you know, nice people. He, he didn't use these terms, but anyway, he gave a lot of information and he is an insider. He was an insider, but he's not the only one. There was another one, Bill Cooper, Milton William Cooper, who worked for the US Navy and for the US Air Force. And until 1989, he gave many lectures and uh, from those lectures came out a reality which is a little bit different uh, from the Dr. Stephen Greer's perspective of the alien presence in the solar system. But I'm not talking about, you know, he is wrong, I'm right. We're not talking in these terms. I'm talking about that there are and there are were insiders and uh, with different testimonies. So because this doesn't like it does not make sense, you know, you turn your sight to another direction. No, I'm sorry. You have to consider everything. Okay, so, but the Jesuit, did he say anything yes. to Barbato yes. about... Yes, he said something that became public. Because in the interview, became public, in the interview that Barbato released to me, uh, granted to me, said that the Jesuit told him that this extraterrestrial race, uh, which uh, would be pre present, present on this planetoid, which is uh, approaching us, according to him, are a, wo a warrior race. 
he didn't use this uh, this term he used another one but the the meaning is it is a warrior race is he talking did he use the term anunnaki uh, if i remember yes yeah, yes my, there is no doubt he identified to, that race with the race uh, which was adored in mesopotamia thousands of years ago the anunnaki which means those who came who from heaven came to earth there is no doubt about this according to the jesuit and this is uh, the reason maybe <laughs> for which uh, this story is dynamite because not only changes our perspective of uh, humankind in the universe, but also, if it is true, is a threat to us because of the effect of the passage of this planet, not only because of the presence of this race in the past on this planet and their activities on Earth. Did he explain how you could have an inhabited planet that is actually yes. spends a lot of its orbit in yes. a deep yes. cold of space where yes. no life could ever Of course. Uh, it's a very intelligent and uh, interesting question. This guy here in the picture, this is a picture uh, which belongs to a US Naval Observatory. It is in the public domain in uh, the US Naval Observatory website. The gentleman on the right is Robert Sato Herito, an astronomer who worked by the US Naval, US Naval Observatory. And on the left, there is his former colleague, Christie, who was the author of the discovery of one of the satellites of Pluto, Charon, in 1978. Robert Sutton Herito. Robert Sutton Herito was an astronomer, an astronomer involved in the search for Planet X. He wrote several articles about the possible, possible existence of this planet in our solar system. And Zechariah Sitchin, who is the author of this book, The End of Days, Armageddon and Prophecies of the Return, in 1990, August 1990, if I remember well, went to Harrington's studio at the US Naval Observatory, they talked about the possible presence of another planet not yet discovered. And Robert Sato Harrington, in that occasion, discussed the possibility of life on that planet. In spite of its distance with a very thick atmosphere, he said, yes, it's possible to have life. Now, I can add something else. If this planet exists, and it is the ancient planet adored by the Sumerians and the, the other civilization in Mesopotamia, it means that this planet came into the solar system as an intruder. So it means that in a very ancient past, this planet was not part of our solar system. And this could explain this could, it could uh, explain the strange features of our solar system. For example, think about planet Uranus, the way he rotates and about the inclination of its axis, about the ecliptic plane, he rotates like this. The astronomers cannot explain why. You have to assume that maybe in the past there was a collision. But if there was a collision, maybe what there is written in the ancient text, like uh, the Seven Tablets of Creation, the Enuma Elish, Aphrahasis, which are considered by the historians uh, like a mythology, like a set of myth, maybe, as Zechariah Sitchin suggested, he was the first scholar to suggest this, those myths really happen. They are just, you know, the remains of historical records, told us by the world of legend, the world of cosmogony. And Otto Harito 
talked about the possibility of life on that planet. Unfortunately, he died in 1993. But he was an employee, a government employee. And isn't it true that you told us that Zachariah Sitchin has suggested that Harrington died um, suddenly of questionable circumstances? I had the, I had the, I had the lucky to interview Dr. Zachariah Sitchin for the Italian magazine Youth Notiziario in uh, last uh, summer 2006 and uh, in uh, his lines, because it was a written interview, Zechariah Sitchi just under point that he became shocked when he, when he knew, he discovered, when he found out that the young and vigorous man Harrington was dead, but he didn't, he didn't make any reference, you know, just a few dots after the statement. He didn't make any implications, you know, he just suggested that he was very surprised that the gentleman that was interviewed by him in August 1990 was dead, because he was a brilliant man, a brilliant scientist, he was 50 years old, he died because of a cancer, according to a biography. But one of the most important points is that, according to the biography, which is available on the US Naval Observatory website, written by one of his colleagues, Dr. Worley, if I remember well his name, according to this bi biography written very well, is that at the end of his career, Robert Harrington lost interest in searching for Planet X, in the search for Planet X. But if you pay attention to the articles that Robert Harrington wrote in his career, well, the impression is on the opposite way. One of his last articles is dated 19... 99, if I am correct, and he was still convinced that Planet X exists somewhere outside our solar system. The difference between Zechariah Sitchin and Harrington hypothesis is that Harrington hypothesis was more concentrated on an orbit which was not cometary. Zechariah Sitchin according to his studies on ancient texts, is convinced that the Nibiru's orbit is cometary because of the text are in evidence. Okay, can we, let's get back to the, to the Jesuit, okay, information. I'm sure you are asking me if I know if there is a date, if the Jesuit gave a date, possibly. Okay. No date. I mean, most of the information that the Jesuit gave to Barbato are in the public domain now. My website, on his website, on Nexus, New Times magazine, because the right. interview to what the... What is not in the public domain? I, I don't know, I cannot answer to your question. I know a couple of things. First of all, the strange three letters on the classification markings that you can see on the introduction to the Jesuit footage, the first three letters, SPS, is a mystery, was a mystery years ago, is a mystery now, yet. Barbato doesn't want to talk about this, because it is his choice. Another mystery is about what the Jesuit told Barbato about the nature of the Anunnaki. This is a a, sensi a sensitive uh, point. What do you mean by about the nature of the Anunnaki? Well, about how they look like, about their history. I mean, read, for example, the lost book of Enki, one of uh, the most outstanding books written by Zechariah Sitchin. There are no comments by 
switching, no comments, no just a translation from ancient text. You read that text and you will see that the ancient history of those gods in Mesopotamia is an history of wars, of envious peoples, of, uh, you know, all uh, the, the evil relationships that we have, and even many times, you know, uh, moments of calm, moments of uh, uh, generosity, kindness, discussions, you know, struggles, moments of peace, struggles, moments of peace, you know? But tell me something, but, you, uh, you know Barbado, but, you know Barbado has had this information from the Jesuit that he has he, not released. Yes, he Is told Barbado me this. Is Barbado troubled by this information? Uh, I can imagine that if at least half of all the story is true, just half, not in the entire story is true. Can you imagine how many problems can we have? Can he can have, I can have, and even the people, because at a certain point, if other evidence will come out, then you put all the pieces together. Then, if other evidence will come out, you know, I'm talking about more uh, scientific points of view close to what you are not expecting. Politicians like the recent Japanese politician in Japan, that a few months ago said something about UFOs. They said something about extraterrestrial presence. Three, I'm talking about three Japanese politicians as private citizens in front of journalists. The, for example, Minister of the Defense, the Auto Defense, the, the leader of the Japanese, and even the Minister of the Education said something in one week. Mm -hmm. If other leaders will come out with the information about this problem, so I think that uh, there is the, the little, the tiny possibility that you can have, you know, the, the how do you say? Do you know the the ancient myth of the Pandora's box? You know, and the problem is, are the people ready? Not just. <laughs> for the truth, but for the responsibility to face the truth. Because if such a truth will come out, we have to take some decisions about what to do. But there are two entirely different situations here that are being described. One is the presence of a large planetary body, whatever it is, that's coming this way, possibly causing effects on the sun, possibly causing um, other effects if its planet, if its orbit should come near the Earth, uh, the problems of, of Earth changes, um, resonance effects on the Earth's crust, all kinds of things like that. The other situation that y you seem to be describing is one where this planet could be inhabited. And we have to ask this question on behalf of the people who are watching this, and that is that it seems impossible that you could have a planet out there which could be inhabited with humanoid life. Why would anyone want to live there when it's about minus 200 degrees Celsius yes. and the sun would be a tiny little bright yes. spot in the sky and would be completely dark? You, you are perfectly right. If the right. planet is, so, is sufficiently large as to cause major problems on a geophysical scale, it's going to be a large gas giant, or maybe even what in the astronomers call a brown dwarf. It's a sort of half a star. Ac it's not really a planet at all. Okay. According to my opinion, first of all, if Nibiru exists, came in our solar system as intruder, it means that in an ancient past belonged to another solar system, another star system. You know, the, the people... Uh, the people thinks about uh, the people think about uh, the universe as a peaceful place. You know, it is not like this. We have a strange perspective. The universe is a violent places because of our you know 
our sense of time, it seems that nothing is happening in the solar system. But sometimes, you know, something ha happens. And you say, oh, well, maybe the universe is a little bit different. Maybe the solar system sometimes is violent. For example, years ago, a comet in several pieces, you know, uh, went against Jupiter, the comet shoemaker Levy 9. If this planet in billions years ago was part of another star system, and maybe because of the star exploded, became before a red giant, and maybe later, you know, there was another transformation, maybe this planet left his star system. That's why, you know, the solar gravitation could affect this planet. Okay, but let me ask you something, because what we want to know is, what, what would the Jesuits say to Barbato, who you said is, is very um, difficult, he, he's very careful as a researcher, and he must have some scientific basis. He's, he's written articles on science. So he must have questioned the Jesuit to say, you know, how can this be? Do you know what kind of evidence the Jesuit gave him, other than the videotape that shows... He gave, he gave him the pictures, for example. Right. That one. He gave him... But did he give him scientific data? that you know of? I don't think that he gave to him scientific data, but the scientific data are under our eyes because, first of all, I told you, so Robert Sato Harrington was an astronomer interested mm -hmm. in Planet X. But he was not the only one. Another one is Patrick Moore, the famous scientific uh, astronomer. He wrote just a few lies about Planet X, but what he wrote you know, if you read what Patrick Moore, the British astronomer, wrote about Planet X, you say, yes, it may exist. And there are other people who are, you know, a <laughs> little bit uh, uh, interested. For example, a few weeks ago, New Scientist, one of the major British magazines, wrote an article about the possibility of Planet X. And in the article, there is a discussion about a recent work made by an a, 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 a mathematician and physicist who comes from Brazil. He is an Italian-Brazilian uh, scientist who now is working in Japan. He earned a PhD in uh, Earth and Planetary uh, Science at Kobe University. And is working on the possibility of Planet X. For example, just a moment. This one is an old book written in 1926 and published again many times. This is the edition of 1944. The title is The Elements of Astronomy. It is written by an astronomer, Edward Arthur Fett, professor of astronomy in Carleton College. I bought this book in the United States of America, in Florida. And uh, at page 221, there is something about Pluto. And I read for you, quote, he's talking about Pluto mass, which uh, was not known in the last century until 1978, when Christie and Harriton found out Charon. The mass is uncertain, the mass of Pluto. But according to Wiley, it is approximately that of the Earth. They thought that the mass of Pluto has the mass of the Earth. If the mass has, is as small as it is, it, it could neither have produced the perturbation which Lowell found for Uranus. Lowell is the scientist who invented the expression Planet X. Nor those Pickering found for Neptune. It is therefore possible that a much more massive planet still remains to be found. The search is being continued at the Lowell Observatory. This is a scientific book. The mass of Pluto is lower than the mass of the Earth. 
much lower. These are okay. scientific data. Now, one of the problems here is that the term Planet X has been used in different ways by different astronomers. Some of them are talking it as being Planet X, the unknown planet, and also some of them are referring to it as the tenth planet that actually is beyond Pluto or Chiron. There are, th um, there are thousands of celestial bodies beyond yeah. Pluto because they belong to the Kuiper belt object. Yeah. The problem is, are we talking about a celestial body which returns into our solar system as a comet? Or are we talking about a celestial body very massive, you know, yeah. outside the solar system? But, this is the main question. Yes. But you didn't answer my question. I mean, I have to say this, because if we include this in the interview, our listeners will notice that you didn't answer, is how can life exist yes. on, yes. Know, as far how, away from the sun how, as Pluto? How, 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 can we get, how can we get to the moon? Because of, we develop the space technology, we develop the space flight. I mean, what, I, what I'm talking about, if other extraterrestrial races reached a good level of technology and uh, you know they don't destroy each other like we are doing on our planet because we are not able it seems that uh, we are not able to manage the you know the sources uh, of our planet if they are able to survive to the point the critic point of auto destruction they can survive in any condition any condition because they can you know they can build underground facilities. They can build motherships. Under natural conditions, the answer is not for the intelligent life like us, but under artificial condition, conditions. Under the surface of the planet, yes. Because we developed a, you know, a, a very sophisticated civilization. We are able to reach the satellites. We send space probes in the deep space. We are able, you know, to fly in the atmosphere and out the atmosphere. This is my, you know, possible answer to your question. If this race come from, comes from another star system, they survived maybe under the surface. And they have many outposts, maybe even in our solar system, maybe in Mars, maybe, you know, on the Jupiter's satellites. And maybe they have outposts even here on Earth, even now. Okay. This is the political problem, the political issue. You know? Right. In the Jesuit footage, there's a small object that is clearly shown. It looks like a small moon or a space. I thought it was yes. I thought the problem is that during, you know, the frames are, uh, you know, it's a footage, so you have frame by frame, you know, we are talking about thousands and thousands of frames. But the behavior of that object is not a, a behavior of a possible satellite, because all of a sudden the object, the object, mysterious object, appears, and after a few seconds the object disappears. So, if the footage is real, is a real uh, observation in a deep space of a planetoid, it means that we are facing a possible spacecraft which is able to materialize and dismaterialize. The problem is, is it an authentic footage or a fake? <laughs> what Barbato told us is that he checked the credential of his whistleblower, his deep throat. He was really a Jesuit on duty in the Vatican. Yes. This is did the, the most. This is did the, the Jesuits important. say what that object was, or was Barbato mm, just left no. to guess? Okay. Nothing that I know about okay. it. Another question I'd like. To, another question I'd like to ask you is: um, uh, Are you familiar with the testimony of uh, Dr. Bill Deagle? Bill Deagle. Deagle. Bill Deagle. No, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, let me summarize uh, the reason for the question very carefully. He says, um, and he's worked on the inside for the American government for many years, and now he's a whistleblower. He says that the Jesuits 
are at the top of the pyramid of all the intelligence agencies in the world. Um, he talks about Project Omega, that's what he says, and he says as well that the Jesuits are uh, running and controlling the South Pole Telescope, which is in existence specifically to observe the incoming object. Do you have any comment on record about any of that at all? There is one aspect of uh, all this affair on which Barbato didn't say anything, and I am surprised that all the ufologists, all the presumed researchers didn't want to investigate. Because I can understand, you know... For example, I, I wrote many articles, but I didn't uh, write anything about what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the three letters that you see in the introdu introduction to the Jesuit footage. SVS. What the Jesuit told Barbato in the interview that the Jesuit granted to Barbato, because after the interview that Barbato granted to me in September 2006, if I remember well, Barbato on his website spread the interview that the Jesuit granted to him. And he said that the kernel of all the secret societies now on our planet is SBS. Nobody wrote a single lie on the subject. Barbato didn't say anything more because of uh, maybe I can understand him okay. if it is a sensitive. What could it be though? It, I mean just if you know something about all of this SVS I don't know anything about this but I can tell you something. Think about Dr. Stephen Green researches. He said many times, we are destroying our planet because our technology is based on fuels, you know? We burn our fuels. Maybe there are extraterrestrial intelligence that found out other source of energy so we can stop the energy crisis. Why, until now, all, you know, the alternative source of energy can, cannot find enough space in our society? because of, there is so much interest in, you know, take advantage of the oil. Question, is it possible that there is something that doesn't want that free energies, you know, can become familiar? Yes, of course. And do you think that these people are acting by secrecy or are acting in, you know, another way, in front of the public? Of course, no. If okay, didn't, didn't Stephen Greer also say in his book, his yes. recent book, yes. something about yes. the Jesuits, yes. that he was approached by a person yes. who said... He had a meeting in the past, he wrote this in one of his chapters, he then threw forbidden knowledge, if I remember the title of the book, and he said that in the first years of the 19th, last century, he had a meeting, and one of the insiders of the Black World, said to him, ah, do you want to know something more? I have to talk to some Jesuits. And this came out after Barbato's testimony. So this is an indirect confirmation of what Barbato told us. And I am very surprised that Dr. Stephen Greer didn't say anything about Barbato's testimony. Another thing that I want to point out, it appears that this, you know, SPS possible structure could be the famous shadow government. You know? How many people talk about, ah, oh, there is a shadow government. Where is it? Who are these people? Maybe for the first time we have an evidence, a strong evidence that it exists. And let me tell you something else. This footage was according to what I understood, was, how do you say, intercepted by the Jesuit who contacted Barbato, and this SPS structure is not a legal structure. If a secret service in the Vatican exists, you know, 
it exists by secrecy, by its illegal structure. I mean, the Vatican administration, if they have created a secret service, they have done this in the past, but, you know, Pope after Pope, you can imagine how many dossiers were prepared for the next Pope. So, we are talking about a secret structure, which is perfectly legal. But if, you know, somewhere, another structure came out, like this presumed SPS, yes, maybe this is one of the reasons why the Jesuit and the other colleagues came out. Listen, guys, we have different problems. One is the coming of Planet X, and the other one is that other people decided to do something in the countries of the world without the knowledge of the people. And maybe these people are responsible for the situation that we are facing now. Maybe, this is my point of view, maybe 9-11 is related to this. I cannot imagine that the only reasons for which the United States of America are losing so many lives of his sons, you know, young, young guys, the soldiers, and killing civilians by chance, not by chance, and losing the reputation in front of the world, because in the last years, after 9-11, the US administration lost so many reputation because of its decisions. I cannot imagine that the only reasons are economics, are, you know, taking advantage of the fuel. No, it is not possible. Of course, a lot of money, you know, this is one reason, but you know, I am sure that the 9-11, Planet X, and this possible structure are pieces of one big puzzle. This is my opinion, strong opinion. You have a picture behind you yes. of, of a man, yes. and I would like you to tell me, us the, the story that you told us earlier. Yes. On uh, your left, on here, over there, there is uh, my former identification card of a, a meeting which took place in Venice, on a Venice island, in the Venetian Lagoon in June 2006. The title was Media Between Citizens and Power. I was correspondent for uh, Gruppo Editoriale Olimpia, who published two mega several magazines. Two of them are Tecnologia e Difesa, Technology and Defense, and another one is Ufo Notiziario, for which I wrote several articles until 2006. For these two magazines, Tecnologia e Difesa, Technology and Defense, and Youth Notiziario, I was correspondent in those days. So, uh, I participated to the press conference held by Mikhail Sergeyevich Gorbachev in June 2006. And uh, I was so lucky that I found a little space to make questions to the former president of the Soviet Union. And when I took the microphone, this speech, I made these pictures. This is a, a detailed, a detail of several pictures that I have taken in those in that day. And when I took the microphone, I stood up and in front of everybody there were maybe 40, 50 journalists, Italian journalists, even some TVs. And I asked him about uh, his conversation with Ronald Reagan in Geneva in 1985. My question was overall about 
the declarations, outstanding declaration made by Paul Elie, former uh, Minister of Defense of Canada. Uh, anyway, I was, I was talking about Ronald Reagan and uh, his mentions to a possible alien threat, a possible alien planet, because Ronald Reagan made several statements, I think there are five, about the, a possible threat to the humanity, to the mankind from an alien planet. And during my, my speech, little speech, Gorbachev interrupted, yes, yes, I know. Uh, even Ronald Reagan talked about me, about, about this stuff with me. So I said to Gorbachev, yes, I know, in Geneva in 1985. At that time, it was the first meeting, the first summit between Gorbachev and Ronald Reagan. And then later on, I continued and I asked him, and you talked about a possible alien threat an extraterrestrial invasion, I didn't use these terms, but anyway, I pointed out that even him talked about a possible extraterrestrial threat. And I asked him, is it true? Is it correct? And uh, he didn't answer. Uh, he didn't answer. He said, uh, I don't remember. I don't remember. According to me, it means... Uh, it's better if we change the discussion. But anyway, he was a gentleman. Why? Because he didn't deny. He didn't deny, and in spite of when I asked him a comment about the declaration made by Paul Elie, the former Minister of Defense in Canada, and the former Minister Paul Elie said that George Bush and his administration is preparing an intergalactic war, which, uh, you know, sounds ridiculous, but if uh, this statement is made by a former politician leader of an important country, doesn't sound ridiculous, according to me. Anyway, at the end, he answered to me about the possible threat of the NEOs, the near-Earth objects, and about the Paul Elier declaration said something like this. Yeah, we are in the range of hypotheses, which is, you know, it, it, it is an honest, an honest uh, point of view, but, you know, which shows it's better, you know, or he is not interested or he, he wants to change the subject. But the most important thing is that later on, in October 2006, if I remember, he was hosted by a television program. And on that occasion, in front of the Italian public on TV, in front of the journalist, because of the journalist, Fabio Fazio, at that time, asking something about UFOs and his conversation with Reagan, he, rec he, he remembered, you know, those days and uh, he told, uh, you know, a little bit more about the meeting with Ronald Reagan and what Ronald Reagan said to him about a possible threat. At that time, you know, there was the Cold War and the Soviet Union and the United States of America could not find, you know, anything that can stop the Cold War. And Gorbachev said in front of the Italian public on TV, at that time, you know, we were in the garden of the villa in Geneva in 19, November 1985 and we were discussing a lot, you know and during private conversation we were walking at a certain point Ronald Reagan stopped and he said, listen to me Gorbachev but if now, suddenly, from the space there was an attack from somewhere can we put our forces together? can we stay together? And Gorbachev said, I don't know what you think, but uh, yes, I think we can do it. They are not the exact words that he said, but this is the meaning. What does he mean? It means that in the middle, you know, of difficult times, there was the Cold War, there was the Iron Courting. Ronald Reagan and Gorbachev, in an official meeting, you know, they talked about a possible alien threat to the humankind, to the mankind, to the humanity. 
and Gorbachev didn't deny this. 